We're continuing to go through our sermon series in the afternoon through all the books of the Bible. And we've come a pretty long way now. We're, um, this is message number 60. And we, we haven't, we've done uh, two sermons on some of the books, of course. Uh, but we're at Thessalonians now, 1 Thessalonians. And this is one of the earliest letters of the Apostle Paul. You remember that his letters are kind of clustered together in our Bible. And this is one of the earliest epistles that he wrote. It was written in AD 51. We're pretty sure about that because uh, it mentions Gallio at the time when he was there, who was uh, proconsul. And uh, that's kind of a, a good uh, touch, touch point on the timeline. Paul wrote this just a few months after he planted the church with Timothy and Silas, who is also called Silvanus. They had come from Philippi and had preached at the synagogue in Thessalonica. There had been a wonderful response to the gospel, especially among some of the Greek people, even some prominent people there, which makes an interesting dynamic in the church. But this caused some of the Jews who did not believe to come after Paul with murder in their hearts. They were very hostile toward him and Timothy and Silas. So Paul and his fellows had to be taken away for safety. And this greatly distressed the Apostle Paul. One of the things when you study his writings, you see what a a big-hearted man he was. The love that he had for God's people is phenomenal. And he was distressed because here were these new believers, many of them that had just turned from idols to serve God, and they're in a hostile, persecuting environment without any ministry support from Paul, Timothy, and Silas. And they had not yet been established in the faith. So it was a very difficult thing. He speaks of this in his letter to them and explains that he had tried to come to see them time and time again, but had been hindered by Satan again and again. Finally, he and those with him decided to send Timothy to them, And Timothy had returned with a good report, which was so refreshing to them that they were doing well. They were so glad. They were were in suspense about that, as it were. They they didn't know how they were doing. And when Timothy came back and told them, Paul was delighted with this news. He he feels that he could live again after they came back. It It was so important to him. Out of his great encouragement then, he took up his pen and he wrote this letter to them, both to tell them how glad he was, how thankful he was for the Lord's work in them, that they were, it was a true work as evidenced by the fact that they were standing firm in the gospel, and to add his encouragement and his support of the ministry that Timothy had given them, had, had provided among them to, to strengthen them more in the things that Timothy had spoken to them about and to bring his apostolic stamp upon young Timothy's ministry that they would be... Um, that it would be more effective what Timothy had done. So what we get with this letter to the Thessalonians is a letter written to a healthy congregation and a young congregation. And so one of the distinctive things about this letter is that it's not coming to a church that was riddled with all kinds of problems, but one that was faithful. And we learn what does the Spirit say to a faithful church and a young church. What things do that church need? What, what things can we learn about ministering to a church like that? About perhaps being a church like that? What, what, is, what does the Word of God say to them? So we're going to look at actually six things here as we go an overview of this book. First, we see that a healthy church is a church to thank God for, especially when it is a new church standing strong in the face of persecution. After his customary greetings in the first verse, Paul says in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Notice that he doesn't say, I am thankful for you, but he testifies that he actually thanks God. When he says his prayers. 
I think a lot of Christians today make the, the mistake of saying, oh, well, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for that, and they never actually go and say, Lord, thank you for thus and thus. And so there is an important lesson here that we should actually thank God. And when you, when you pray for other believers in churches, it's good, whenever you think of other believers in churches, it's good to actually thank God for them. Of course, you have to be careful about the opposite danger where you get in the habit of saying, oh Lord, thank you for so-and-so, thank you for so-and-so. It's a habit in your prayers and you're not even thankful at heart. So we need to be thankful, but we also need to say thank you to God for these things. And just, just think of it. When, you're, when you think of other believers that here are people, like these Thessalonians, they, they had been serving idols and God had delivered them by His saving mercies and now they were serving God. And what a precious thing that is. That should fill our hearts up when we, when we learn of people, we hear of churches, we learn of believers in different places. It should make us glad. Here are people who have been brought from the darkness to the light and are serving God. They've been transformed to be His people. You can see how Paul adds the particulars about the Thessalonians that made him especially thankful. That's important to do too. In verse 2 through 6, he mentions how they gave evidence of their election by God, by the work of faith that was in them, the, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. It's interesting because he uses um, faith, love, and hope rather than faith, hope, and love. The Corinthians were deficient in love, and so love came at the end. The Thessalonians were particularly strong in hope because they were being persecuted, so hope came at the end of those three. They had received the word of God, you see, as he says, in much affliction, but that had not hindered them in the least. So they had been proven, as if we tied in with this morning, as uh, those that were not on stony ground hearers. The persecutions had come and they had shown that they were elect by continuing in the Lord. They served Him under persecution and they showed that they were not living for the world or for even worldly Christian type expectations, but for the eternal kingdom that God had promised them in Christ. Paul thanks the Lord not only that this was true of them, but in verse 7 through 10, that their life as a church was having a powerful impact on believers all around the world. When Paul went to other places, sometimes he would hear them saying, you know, talking about, did you hear what happened? Thessalonica, people that were idol worshipers turned to God and they were persecuted and they kept on serving. It was encouraging the other Christians around the world as the, the report of them went forward. Paul said, we don't even have to tell people about it because they already have heard about it when we get to them. Now, this is what you ought to do in your prayers then for other believers in churches. Look for particular things to be thankful about. Paul had these two things and say, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you that they're doing well. If it's an old church, then thank God for keeping them through all the years so that they're still serving Him. It's one of the things I thank the Lord for our denomination. ARP, uh, 1782 in North America, and we still are following the confession that we embraced at that time. I'm very thankful for that. If, if there are a church that is not doing well, thank Him that He has not cast them off and pray for their recovery. In every case, the simple fact that here are people whose names are written down in heaven should be enough to fill us with great thanksgiving for them. Next, in chapter 2, Paul tells us that the kind of ministry that God uses to bring forth a healthy church, such as there was in Thessalonica. He makes it clear that one of the reasons the Thessalonians were faithful was because he and Silas and Timothy were such faithful ministers. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but in 2, 1 through 5, he explains how they preached the word of God to them without compromise, even though they had been persecuted for preaching the word 
just where they'd come from at Philippi. They'd been beaten with rods. They'd been locked up in prison. And when that happens, there's a tendency to pull back on your message, to tone it down a little bit and say, hey, we're going to be careful. I don't want that to happen again. And he just adjusts things a little. He said, we didn't do that. Look at what he says in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 2.1. He says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts." Even after all that had happened to them, they still preached the clear gospel of the Lord. That's exactly, see what, what happens over and over again with ministry so that it's no longer effective is that we tone down the message, the truth, because we're afraid and then the gospel has no power or impact on anybody's life. And the kind of ministry that brings forth new life is the kind that preaches the Word of God without shame, with boldness, and with clarity. Because Paul and his fellow members did not compromise the message, the Thessalonians were able to hear the truth of God and be saved. God in His grace sometimes uses compromised ministry, but it, is almost, it almost always leads to a weak church that will eventually become an apostate church. Because as soon as you start laying aside truth, because it's offensive, after a while, you're going to lose the gospel itself. It's going to all be gone. Of course, it should be understood that faithful ministry does not guarantee faithful congregations. Paul had many places where he preached and there were hard hearts. And just because he was preaching the pure word of God did not mean that people were going to be saved. Certainly with Jesus Christ, no one so faithful as he. And he spoke so as people would be saved, but yet many people were not saved. Uh, even as we saw in the parable that he told was true as he ministered the word of God. So faithful ministry does not guarantee faithful congregations, but it makes it, but, but it is nearly impossible for unfaithful ministry to bring forth faithful congregations. If ministry is compromised, there's not going to be much faithfulness. Okay, the gospel is not preached. How can they be saved? Right? People will go along with whatever. Paul also explains how he and his fellows toiled and labored night and day for the Thessalonians because of their love for them. They did not make demands as apostles, as saying we should be honored because we're apostles of the Lord. But as verse 8 says, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. He summarizes in verse 10, You are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So they were like a loving mother, like a, a loving father, all of these, all these together. Now it may seem, I told you I would get back to this, Paul uh, commending his own ministry here, setting it up like he did. It may seem a little odd for, that Paul is reminding them of how faithful his ministry was to them, his and his companions. But you see, his purpose and the purpose of the Holy Spirit was not to boast. I'm sure it was not. Paul knew that his ministry was all of God. His purpose is to give the Thessalonians, as well as all who read this epistle after them, a model, an example to describe what ministry ought to look like. Because it was a faithful ministry. It was one that the Holy Spirit had given them to work. And so it's given as a model for us to imitate. It would be easy to criticize Paul for boasting so that we could ease the sting of what he says here. But instead, we should be humbled that, and, and compare 
what we're doing to what the example, what the model is. I need to do that as a minister. And our elders need to do that. And so do all of you. You're a minister in your own family, in your own household. You're a minister to your neighbors. You know, what do you like? Do you care for them? Do you, do you really care for others? Do you bring the word of God to them without compromise? Are you an example to them? Do you lay down your life for them? That's what Paul did. Are you bold with the truth? And are you also at the same time gentle, like a father or like a nursing mother? It's unusual to have uncompromising truth along with the tender gentleness of a father or mother for children. But that's what Paul had combined together. And by God's grace, it's possible only by his grace. But such ministry would be of no avail if God did not work in those who received it. Like I mentioned before, faithful ministry does not guarantee results. So once again, in verses 13 through 16, chapter 2, Paul thanks God that the Thessalonians received the word of God when it was brought to them. It was God that did that. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. It's God who made this happen. Because, why do they thank God? Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but, it as, but as it is in truth, the word of God that effectively works in you that believe. Anytime you see people receiving the word of God, God is to be thanked. He's the one that brought that about by his grace. All of this was his doing, both that the word was faithfully preached and that it was faithfully received, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Paul thanks God because he knew that both the faithful preaching and the faithful receiving of the word was from him. Now let's look at the third thing we're taught about a healthy young church in Thessalonians. Third, Paul shows us that a healthy church needs ongoing ministry so that they might be established and encouraged in the faith. It's very stirring to see how eager Paul is to minister to them. You know, I was talking to someone at lunch about the lack of people going out as missionaries in our day, young, young adults going out as missionaries. What you see here with Paul is a passion to go and minister to people who need ministry. He and his companions had been torn away from the Thessalonian believers as soon as the Thessalonians had received the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians 2.17, the word taken away is one that was often used to speak of parents who had their children separated from them, leaving them as orphans, as it were. Paul speaks with great passion in 2.17. He says, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you, having been, having been torn away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. He speaks in verse 18 of how they had tried to come back again and again, but had been hindered by Satan. Satan works very hard, like we mentioned, I mentioned to you this morning. He works very hard to keep ministers of the word away from people who need to hear the word. He's always busy trying to keep people from getting to church, trying to get people separated somehow, sowing division. People who are perfectly healthy all week become ill on the Lord's day. Couples who generally get along with each other have big quarrels on Saturday night and Sunday morning that hinder them from coming to worship the Lord. There are a thousand ploys and we need to pray accordingly, knowing the devil's designs. As the passage develops, Paul goes on to describe his passion to get to them. Chapter 3 begins with the words, When we could no longer endure it. That's strong speaking. We could not endure it to be separated from you. We were, we were tormented by this, by this separation. When we could no longer endure it being apart from you because we knew that you needed our ministry, he explains how they eventually arranged for Timothy to go to them, even though it meant that Paul had to be left alone at Athens. He even indicates that their lives were, I mentioned this in the, in the introduction, it was as if their lives were suspended until while they were waiting for Timothy to come back with a report of how the Thessalonians were doing. In verse 7, he describes how comforted they were and then in, by that report. And then in verse 8, he says, Now we live. 
if you stand fast in the Lord. Do any of you care that much about other souls? I mean, this is, this is what, these are people that he had ministered to. He'd only known them for a few weeks. And here he is just yearning to, to get to them, to bring the word to them, to see how they're doing. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of heart that God would delight in us to have. Verse 9, he gives the glory to God for this. That he says, for what thanks can we render to God for, for, for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake? Because you're doing well before God. Don't you think that would have been a great encouragement to the, to the Thessalonians to hear the apostle talking about how glad he was that they were doing well and how, how concerned he, they, they realized how important it was to do well as he spoke these words to them. That it mattered that they did well in the Lord. It, moved, it would have been very moving to them. Now, this was an important reason that there was an important reason that Paul was so concerned to hear about them how they were doing. He explains in this same section of chapter 3 that his zeal to get to them was because of their need to be established and encouraged in the faith. It wasn't just that he wanted to go and say hi to them. It was that he, he knew that they needed ministry. He was concerned that with all the pressure that they were under because of persecution, with their relatives turning against them and the Jews turning against them and some of the raising, trying to raise up political enmity against them, people trying to discredit the gospel and say how stupid it was, how wrong it was, uh, Jewish unbelievers coming and saying how it didn't comport with the Old Testament, making up things like that, they might have fallen away from faith. It would be very easy for the people in their community that were having, struggling with them. While it's not possible for a true believer to lose his faith, it is possible for those who have professed their faith to end up rejecting their faith. Because not everyone that professes really has faith at the time that they profess. That's what the parable of the sower that we looked at this morning shows us. There are those who receive the word with joy and then fall away because of persecution. They depart. From the church, they depart from Christ. Now they, they were never really of us, or they wouldn't have gone out from us. But, but uh, they they nevertheless had professed. They were among us as far as we knew. They would they would uh, they would not do that at least permanently if they truly were born of God's Spirit. But sometimes when a person professes their faith, you see they are not truly regenerate. That's why they fall away. Paul had experienced this painful reality in his ministry. For example, he had ministered at Galatia. They had received the gospel. But some of them, when the Judaizers came along, they rejected the gospel and began to follow them. He said, I, I, I labored over you in vain, some of you. So Paul shows in Thessalonians that faithful ministry is not only necessary for bringing people to profess faith, but also for keeping them in that profession. God makes hearing the word faithfully taught an integral part of both coming to Christ and also of continuing in Christ. How shall they hear without a preacher initially? And how shall they go on if they are not under the word? Paul was very aware of this. And that's what made him very concerned about leaving the Thessalonians before they had been properly established and encouraged in the faith. Now take a look at how he expressed this in, the, in this passage. At the end of chapter 2, he declares what his hope and joy and crown of rejoicing is. Okay, this is the foundation of things. What is Paul living for regarding the, the Thessalonians? It is that when Christ returns, Paul is going to see them in good favor, in the good favor of Christ. That when Jesus appears in his glory, these Thessalonian people are going to be there in favor, in his favor. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? What, what are we looking for as having ministered to you? It is not, is it not even you, you Thessalonians, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. He was concerned that unless he and his ministry companions returned to establish them and encourage them in their faith, and they weren't established and encouraged, that they might fall away. And that he would not see them there. He makes this quite clear in chapter 3 when he speaks of his reasons for sending Timothy as he did. 
Timothy was sent, as he says at the end of verse 2, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. And then the reason, that's what we're looking at now in verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these effect, afflictions, by all the persecutions. They, they, they would harden themselves and turn away and reject Christ to walk no more with Him because of the persecution. That explains why Paul is so thrilled when he found out from Timothy that they had not been shaken by their afflictions. If they had, Paul's labor among them would have been worthless. As he says at the end of verse 5, it would have been what? In vain. We would have wasted our time. Now, of course, we could say not, not really in that when the gospel goes forth and it's a savor of life unto life to those that believe and of death unto death to those that do not. So God is glorified in ministry, even if it's not fruitful. But nevertheless, as far as his desire and his concern for ministry, it, it would have been wasted, as it were. So we conclude that ministry was essential, not only to bring them to an initial profession of faith, but also that they might continue in that profession. But just what was the work that Timothy was given to do to bring this about? What was this work of establishing them and encouraging them in their faith? What does that work entail? Well, establishing and encouraging are the things that Paul always did when he returned, to, and he always did return, it seems, to minister to those that had received the gospel from him. We see him doing that, for example, in Acts 14. We see him sending Titus to do that in the whole book of Titus, which we'll be getting to shortly. But um, in Acts 14, he returned to all the congregations that he went to on his first missionary journey, and he did these two things. He established them, and he encouraged them. It gives us a pattern of what ought to be done for fledgling churches. Establishing them included appointing elders among them. That's what he did in Acts that we read about. Often those would, be, would have been uh, those who already knew the scriptures of the Old Testament. Perhaps some of the Jewish men or the, the Gentiles that had become proselytes that, that knew the word of God already and could, could be established as elders to give oversight to the people. And now they knew Christ was Messiah and they had been taught by the apostle and to see how that all ties together. They would teach and admonish the congregation in the faith and they would stay in touch with the apostles as they ran into questions and problems. That was how it worked at this time. During this time before the scriptures were complete, they were, the New Testament I mean, they were also given special gifts of prophecy to help them so that they had a ministry that was inspired directly by the Spirit of God. Establishing the church also included catechizing them to make sure that they understood the basics of the faith. The New Testament speaks very often of catechizing. Our word cate catechize comes from a Greek word that uh, refers to that. So it's grounding them in the basics of the faith. In addition to establishing them in their faith, they also encourage them by warning them that we must endure much tribulation in our service to Christ. It's very interesting. That's a note that you find again and again with whenever there's ministry to young churches in the Bible. They're always telling them, now listen, you're going to be suffering for Christ. It's going to be much tribulation if you follow Him. You're going to have trouble in this life if you follow Christ. They always tell people that. They emphasize that. Paul wanted to make sure that they were not overwhelmed with discouragement. That when that happened, that they all knew that following Christ involved many hardships and that this was part of what it meant to follow Him. As Paul says at the end of 3.3, of, of, uh, three, we, we have been appointed to this. In verse 4, he says, For in fact, we, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. We told you so. And as you know, this was something that he emphasized. So we learn from this that new congregations need to be established and encouraged and that all Christians need ongoing ministry from the church. Our Westminster Confession of Faith even says that there is no ordinary possibility of salvation outside of the church. It adds the word ordinary because, of course, there are times when believers are cut off. But even then, they often have brothers and sisters who are praying for them. You know, we all stand in need of ongoing ministry and encouragement, and we need to provide that to each other. 
And that brings us to the fourth thing we in 1 Thessalonians. Healthy churches need to keep on growing. Don't say, oh, I'm a healthy church, don't need to grow anymore. <laughs> no, that's not the way it is. It's striking to see how Paul responds to Timothy's report that he got about that the Thessalonians were doing well. Instead of saying, oh, good. We don't have to pray for the Thessalonians anymore. They're doing fine. We can turn our attention to other places now. <laughs> That's not what he said, is it? No, he turns up his prayers when he hears that they're doing well. He says, this is the place where God's working. I'm going to pray even more now because God's working here. It's very, very, very powerful. Look at uh, 3.10. He says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. We still want to come and do more work among you. Verse 11 through 13, now, he goes on, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. To abound in love. It's love just growing and growing and growing and growing, building on itself. That's what he's talking about, abounding even more. And uh, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and, and toward all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Far from slowing his prayers, the report that God was working among them gave him more zeal than ever. We often pray for places that seem far from God. And well, we should. But we should never suppose that a place where he is working powerfully does not need our prayers. You know, we've been encouraged a lot by what we see going on down in uh, one of our churches there, the uh, church in Woodstock, Ontario. They keep, they've had a huge increase in their membership. They've had... They've been able to start Gillespie that we prayed for today. They've got lots of ministry going on, people coming in from outside. Uh, they're coming to hear the Word of God. It, it's a real blessing. We need to pray for that church. Sometimes, we go, oh, well, they're doing fine. <laughs> you know, we need to pray for these churches that are struggling. The church that Satan's going to attack is the one that, where God is working powerfully. So we should pray all the more when we see that God has worked. You see the content of his prayer. Again, that they would increase and abound and love, and that he would establish their hearts. So because he found, and that was, of course, for a young church, because he found that the Lord was so obviously at work in them, and he goes on, he also, though, urges and exhorts them to abound more and more in doing God's will. So there's prayer, and there's also commandment to go on. You pray that they would go on, and now he tells them to go on. So this is... Uh, Verse chapter 4, the opening of chapter 4, he says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ, strong language, that you should, here it is again, abound more and more. That's what he just prayed for. So he prayed for it, and now he says, go and do it. Abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sometimes you hear Christians talking about finding the will of God. And sometimes when you hear that, they want to know what God's will is about where they should work or who they should marry and many, many such things as that. But the thing that you need to focus on that you know to be God's will is your sanctification. You know from God's word that it is His will for you to abound more and more in obedience to His commandments. Paul mentions two things in particular here that they needed to abound in. One was sexual purity. That each should know how to possess his own vessel. I think that to be the uh, husband or wife. In sanctification and honor. Instead of running around with multiple partners. Uh, a lot of people object to that being uh, referring to a spouse. But if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It speaks of a kind of ownership of each other in marriage. It speaks of how the, the wife's body belongs to her husband and the husband's body belongs to the wife. It works both ways. And we're not to defraud our husband or wife in this matter by withholding our body from them. And in no case are we to have sex outside of marriage. Uh, that's not acceptable. 
Paul mentions sexual immorality because the Greeks saw little wrong in sexual immorality. The preferred relationship for men among the Greeks was with boys that were 12 and under. That was the relationship that they enjoyed for recreation. They had marriages by which they had legitimate offspring, but they found pleasure with mistresses and young boys, and nobody thought much of it. It wasn't a concern to them. Our society is becoming more and more like that. We're doing things now that we would have been appalled by 50 years ago, and even more 100 years ago. First, we began to accept sex before marriage, then alongside of marriage, then homosexual relations, and now we're increasingly accepting this thing of sexual relations with children. And in one way, we are even worse than the Greeks in that we don't recognize the importance of marriage for legitimate children. So we will have, for our sexual uh, running around, we will have broken homes in the midst of all that, which undermines our society even more. Paul makes it clear that for the believer, there is to be no compromise whatsoever when it comes to sexual purity. Just because our society is getting worse and worse doesn't mean we should be not quite as bad. We should be completely diametrically opposite to what our society is when it comes to sexual purity. Even our words are to be pure and holy. Unclean words are unacceptable to God. In 4.6, Paul says that the Lord judges this sin. And in verse 8, he says that those who reject this commandment reject God and reject His Spirit. We run, in, we run into this sort of warning, don't we, in all the epistles. As we've been going through and doing overviews, almost every epistle has something about this. Why? Well, you know why. It's such a huge problem. Everywhere you go, I talk to ministers and they say, biggest problem. People are are being drawn away from the Lord because of of this particular sin. Sexual immorality is a proof that we have rejected Christ as our Savior and God as our God. That's what Paul says here in Thessalonians, that you do not know God if you're living in these kinds of sins. It, It calls for absolute repentance. The other specific thing that Paul mentions that healthy churches need to abound more and more in is love. The Thessalonians were already doing quite well at loving one another. And Paul says, do even better, guys. Do even better. As believers, we should never think that we are loving each other enough. As those who are forgiven by Christ, we can freely admit that we come very short of what God requires, even if we have made great progress. By the grace of God, a lot of you have made great progress. You you love people you never would have loved before you were a Christian. God has changed you. And that's a wonderful thing. But he says, keep on going. One of the best things about the Christian life is that there's always room to grow. You don't reach the ceiling. There's always more to reach forth, as Paul says. I reach forth toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, the fifth thing we learn in Thessalonians about a healthy church is that they have every reason to look forward to the return of Christ. Paul addresses this in chapter 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 11, that whole section there over, goes over a chapter division. In chapter 4, the 13 and following, he addresses a concern that they had about those who had died in the Lord that was causing them a lot of grief. In 4.13, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Those who have fallen asleep, of course, are people that had, had died in the Lord. He begins with words that ought to stir us up to yearn for the return of Christ. Notice when we read this, we see how eager they were about the return. It should stir us up and say, hey, I I mean, I think where we are, we're not so thinking. We don't think about that so much. But look, look what he says. He speaks about how when Christ appears, all who believe will go to meet him in the air, beholding him in all of his glory. He had taught the Thessalonians about this when he was among them. And they were very eager for that glorious day to come. They were, they were delighted with the whole idea. Paul talks about it all the time in his ministry. 
even as we saw at the end of chapter 2 where he described it as his hope and crown and, or hope and joy and crown of rejoicing that he would see them in the presence of Christ in that day. People that had been redeemed and that were in the Lord's care and favor forever and ever. He would know those Thessalonians, there they are with the Lord of glory forever and ever. And over there are the Colossians and over there are the Ephesians and the different people that, that he cared about and that he had ministered to. It was a day that he was, he was anticipating. This enthusiasm had reached the hearts of the Thessalonians. And I am concerned that it's not nearly as much a part of most of us as it ought to be. Perhaps because we're not persecuted. Okay, so we, we're pretty comfortable with things. It's part of a healthy Christian to be eager to see Christ appear in all of His glory. But the concern that the Thessalonians had was for those among them that had already departed to be with the Lord. They were concerned because that they would not that they would be left out when Christ returned. And this added to the grief of losing someone that you loved in this world, that also they're, they're going to miss out on that glorious day because they're already in the grave now. They apparently believed that the resurrection, and they had no reason not to believe otherwise, I guess, because there wasn't anything that I know of that's revealed in the Scripture until now about it. So they believed that in the resurrection... Uh, that, that uh, these brothers and sisters would, would, would miss out and that the resurrection would occur after Jesus came back. That then the, the people would come forth from their graves. So these departed saints would miss his, his glorious entrance that they were so looking forward to. And they didn't want them to miss this great event. They said, oh, if he could have just held on a little bit. They didn't know when Christ was coming back, but if he could have held on a little longer... But, but you can see how Paul teaches them otherwise in 4, 16 and 17. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now they knew about that. That, that was in Matthew and uh, had been taught by our Lord Jesus and taught by the apostles. He says, And the dead in Christ will rise first. And that's something I'm not sure whether that had been taught yet. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. They won't miss out. These departed ones will not miss out at all. He tells them to comfort one another with these words. And then in chapter 5, he speaks about the time of Christ's return. When is he going to come back? Well, the truth is we simply don't know when he's coming. Uh, nor are we meant to know. He comes as a thief in the night. Thieves don't publish their schedule. You know, I'm going to hit, these are the houses I'm going to hit next week and put it up in the newspaper. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, the thief's coming to our place uh, tomorrow. Uh, for, in in uh, 5, 1 and 2, he says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. A lot of embarrassment could have been prevented in the Christian church if we'd paid a little bit of attention to this, there are all these groups that have gone out, you know, oh, it's a thousand years after Christ, we've got to go up on the mountain and meet him, he's going to come back now, because it's a thousand, or whatever, there's different times in history where groups have done this, and then they, oh, well, I guess we were wrong. You know, they get, they get the calculation, well, you don't know. That's, that, of course you're wrong. You know, maybe someday, you suppose that, I've sometimes wondered if the Lord will come back on a day when nobody anywhere in the world had predicted it because there's, almost, there's so many dates that they predicted it. But anyway, whatever the case, um, they, they, uh, the, the thing is, is that concerning the times and seasons, we don't know. Well, after stating this, Paul then encourages them to be always ready and always full of joyful anticipation. It says, for, in verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. That's why we can be joyfully in, in joyful anticipation of that day. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we may live with Him. What a marvelous truth that is for healthy churches who know Christ. God has appointed that we will be completely delivered and that we will live with Him, with His Son, 
and with, in, in our Father's house forever and ever. Healthy churches need to keep that glorious hope alive among them. It is my duty as a minister to continually set this hope before you. And it is your duty and joy to cherish this hope in your hearts. If you would do this, many of your problems in this world would be resolved. You're so concerned about what's happening to you and the problems that you have right now. You're overly concerned about them that because you're not looking at the glorious promise of our glorious Lord coming and appearing and us going to be with Him. It changes your whole perspective when you have that set before you. Everything here becomes, as Paul called it, a very small thing. It's a very little trial. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. That's how he describes it. It doesn't matter, if, doesn't matter what happens to you if somebody tortures you. And of course we wouldn't want something like that. But it's just for a little while. And then that glorious day comes. That's how Paul kept on going. That's how he could be in in Philippi in the prison and beaten with rods and then go and just preach the same message again without changing it. And then go from Thessalonica where he was driven away and do it again at Berea. And then go from there and do it again. That's how he was able to do this. And now for the last thing about a healthy young church. A healthy young church must learn to live under the care of faithful elders. Paul speaks here about mutual responsibilities. This is the last part of chapter 5. Mutual responsibilities of both the elders and the members in in their relationship with each other. Most likely, we're not told this specifically, but most likely when Timothy had visited them, he had helped them in ordaining elders. Some of them were likely, as I mentioned before, elders in the synagogue who had believed, come to believe the gospel. And there was probably one or two that had the gift of prophecy among them and and teaching who were appointed to preach among them. So now Paul is giving them instructions about how to live in a way that would please God in that relationship between elders and congregation. First, he urges the congregation to respect their elders. In in, uh, 5, 12 through 13, he says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, to recognize does not mean simply to be able to identify who they are. You know, that guy and that guy and that guy are the elders. But it's to accept the place, to recognize the place that God had given them, and to honor them in that place, that position as spiritual leaders. This might have been challenging For the Thessalonians. Remember what I mentioned before that there were prominent people among the Greeks that had believed. And they weren't used to submitting to anyone. You know, they weren't used to having someone that was over them, as he describes here. They are over you. And I don't like somebody being over me. That's how it was, though. They these people, it's hard in a society where for in our society too, where we look at submission as always a demeaning thing. And that's because in the hands of an unbelieving authority, it is demeaning. Submission itself is not demeaning. When there's an unbelieving authority over you, it is. When there's a, a godly authority, he's there for your good and for your help. And it's a delight to submit to such a one. But our society, we, we have a hard time with it. The Greeks had their hard time because they had all these ranks. And if you, you were a high-ranking person, it was really weird to su- submit to someone as a spiritual authority that was a lower rank than you. So, and, and we have this, our own problem. Yet it says that the elders are over you in the Lord, exercising the authority of God that God has given them. Those who refuse to join a church and not to have elders over them are disobeying the Lord. It's a very important thing that God has appointed. And it's very common today that people don't want to be under underneath, because authority, under authority, I don't want to submit to me. I don't want to answer. I don't want to take vows. I don't want to have that kind of responsibility. I want to be free. But you see, that's not what we're called to. He says, you know, that to recognize those who labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly. Ruling elders have been appointed by God in the church, and it's not for us to modify the government that he has appointed. This has been done all along in either direction. Sometimes we give men more authority than God gave them, 
and we have bishops and things. That's what the early church did. They followed the kind of their model of government and put people in high positions where one man was over lots of people. The Bible didn't ever appoint that. And uh, then there's the other side where we say, oh, no, nobody's to be in charge. Uh, our sister church in Sydney Mines has compromised in this matter. We're trying to address them about that. But they have replaced their session with a church council. And it has a different structure. It has a different authority. It doesn't answer to a presbytery. It's, uh, it's made up of both uh, men and women on the council. And uh, they're following models that are more acceptable to our present society. People will like it, but they're not following the scriptures. God has called the elders to admonish us. And that means to put you in mind of things. And of course, the things they put you in mind of was about the Lord. To comfort you with his promises. That's part of admonishing. To warn you with his warnings. Admonish is often used that way. To keep you in mind of his commandments and of your calling. All such things. It's a very important office. Therefore, you are to esteem them very highly in love for their work. Next, Paul exhorts the elders to warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Now, he may be telling everyone to do this mutually uh, among them, but especially, I think, after addressing the elders, that it, it pertains to the elders as part of their, their official work. Other people do it unofficially. The elders do it officially. They're, they're to be all that Paul said he and his fellow mem- ministers were who administered among them the, what he outlined for us back in chapter 2. Uncompromising in truth, but at the same time tender and affectionate like a father to children and like a nursing mother. These new elders needed to be diligent to provide that kind of care for the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers. Paul goes on to give a few more exhortations about rejoicing and giving thanks, praying without ceasing, being careful about how they received prophecy, neither despising prophecy or gullibly believing every single thing that somebody said claiming to be a prophet. All are things which promote the purity and peace of a healthy young church. So he ends the book with a very encouraging reminder that God will continue the work that he had begun in the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. That kind of encouragement is needed, lest we be discouraged. What we sang in Psalm 23, the goodness and mercy of the Lord will follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in his house forever. God is the one that pursues us with his grace and enables us to continue growing in our walk with him. Paul began by thanking God for the conversion of the Thessalonians. Then midway through his letter, he thanked God especially for keeping the Thessalonians and all the troubles that they had had. And now he ends the letter by assuring them that God will continue to sanctify them so that they can indeed abound more and more in their calling before the Lord. Please stand and let us give thanks to the Lord for His work in us. And let us ask Him to continue the work that He has begun, so that we might abound more and more in our love for one another. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank You for the people in this congregation that are saints in the Lord. What a marvelous thing. There are people that could be running around in the darkness without the knowledge of God, without salvation, without hope, under your wrath and condemnation. But they are not, Lord. You have called them. You have chosen them. You have appointed them. You have given them salvation. You have sent your Son to Redeem us. And He has completed the work that You gave Him to do. And in Him, we have forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Father, what could be more wonderful than that? We praise You and we thank You that there are people here in this room for whom You have done that. There are people that will be at the church at Glen Home for whom You have done that. 
There are people all around our city, all around the world. There are people here visiting from other congregations that are full of people for whom you have done that. Father, how we praise you and how we thank you. Father, you are such a kind and a gracious God. How could we ever praise you enough? We thank you, Lord, also that you, you have kept us, Lord. Here, here we are, a people who have living in a world that, that hates you, living in a world that wants to discourage anyone that follows you from doing so. Oh, sometimes they all nicely say that it's nice for you or whatever, but in truth, they'd rather we didn't. The pressure is there always. And we pray, oh Lord, that we praise you for keeping us, Lord. We thank you that you maintain and preserve your people and that you bring us sometimes to a crisis. And that when we are yours, you bring us through so that we continue and we do not depart from you. Oh Lord, we pray that you would continue your work in the people here. We pray, oh Lord, that we would love one another more and more, that we would abound in love. We pray that we would also be sanctified, that we would be holy, that we would observe your commandments. We think especially about this commandment that was highlighted here in Thessalonians about sexual purity, chastity. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would abound in that, that we would learn how to live as your people. Father, this is the thing that really distinguishes the world from the church, is this very matter. It's an outward distinction. Father, uh, we have holiness in that we worship you and not idols. And we have holiness in that we are sexually pure and we, uh, we adhere to marriage rather than promiscuity. Father, how we pray that we would have these distinctives and that we would shine as lights in our community. And may we do all of these things, not only having love for one another, but also love for our community. Father, we know that when Paul went to the Thessalonians, they were unbelievers. He loved them then. He loved them also even more when they came to faith. We pray, Lord, that we would be earnest about the people that live around us and in helping them to find the grace of God, that they may be those who are numbered with us on that day when Jesus comes. We thank you for that day, Lord. Keep us alive in that hope. Keep us refreshed in that hope. It will change us so much, Lord, as we go through. I know there are various people in this congregation that are going through trials at this time. Father, how it lightens our affliction when we remember the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and that we're going to see him, that we're going to meet him, and that we're going to be with him forever and ever in his Father's house. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. We praise you, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen.